Good evening, and welcome to the 10th Annual Charles T. Manette Dem Democracy Awards Ceremony. I am Ken Blackwell, IFAS Chairman, and I'm honored to open this evening's celebration. The Democracy Awards are named for Chuck Manette, who chaired the board at a time when IFAS was supporting young democracies in Eastern Europe. Since then, we've worked in more than 145 countries. Chuck touched the lives of many around the world and is missed dearly. We celebrate his contributions to democracy building and thank his family, Kathy and Michelle, for carrying on his tradition. Since 1987, IFAS has provided critical assistance to elector electoral processes in every region of the world. The Democracy Awards emphasize our belief that the work of empowering people transcends political parties and national uh, borders. Tonight, we pay tribute to three outstanding individuals who shared Chuck Manette's commitment to freedom and democracy. Steve Hatley, Marco Wallstrom, and Madeline Albright. I am proud to share the stage with these incredible individuals who have done so much and inspired so many to help the world reach its full democratic potential. I also have the honor to welcome many distinguished guests. I want to recognize my co-chairman and my buddy Don Schweitzer. and current and former members of the IFAS board for their leadership and service. If you could please stand at your spot. I would appreciate it. F current and former. <laughs> we also have representatives from the diplomatic community, including ambassadors, and senior officials from around the world. Thank you for joining us. I would also like to recognize IFAS's Consortium of Elections and Political Process Strengthening Partners at the National Democratic Institute and the International Republican Institute, including NDI President Derek Mitchell and IRI President Dan Twining. Twining. I ask all of my colleagues at NDI and IRI to please stand in their spot for recognition. <laughs> IFAS is proud to receive support from donors around the globe. The US Agency for International Development and the Department of State and in 2019 alone, the UNDP and governments from Australia, the United Kingdom, Canada, Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Sweden, and Mexico. Tonight, ceremony and the projects funded by the Technology for Democracy and Innovation Funds would also not be possible without the generous support of, technology, of our technology partners like Facebook, corporate sponsors, and individual donors. I thank all of you on behalf of my colleagues at IFAS for your generous and wonderful support. Last November, we welcomed Tony Banbury as IFAS's new president and CEO. Tony brings nearly 30 years of experience in public service and has quickly immersed himself in IFAS's work, traveling to the field to meet colleagues and partners on the ground and undertaking a strategic planning process to guide us into IFAS's new future. It is my pleasure to welcome him to the stage. Tony.
Good evening, everyone, and thank you so very much for coming. It's really great to see everyone here for such an exciting evening for me and, and my colleagues. I'd like to welcome you all to the Charles T. Manat Democracy Awards Dinner. As our board chair, Ken Blackwell, said, Charles Manat has an incredibly important legacy for our organization as well as for democratic politics in this country. Uh, I'd like to begin by recognizing members of the diplomatic community who have joined us tonight, uh, officials from the U.S. government, the administration and Congress, uh, our IFAS board members, uh, our partner organizations, a lot of the same folks that Ken Blackwell recognized, uh, uh, definitely uh, members of the Manat family, uh, friends, thanks for coming, uh, colleagues, and very much uh, the team who put together tonight's event from IFAS who have been working so hard. We all know that democracy around the world is under threat in unprecedented ways. And your presence here tonight is a statement of shared concern and common values. Tonight's gathering is not just to celebrate the freedoms and benefits that representative democracy provide to over half of the world's population, but also to pay tribute to three special individuals, Secretary Albright, uh, Margot Wallstrom and Steve Hadley, uh, and also to the tremendous contributions that they have made to advancing the causes of democracy. Uh, before we celebrate those three individuals, though, I want to talk about the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, IFIS, and how we see the world, just briefly. Uh, we have just completed a strategic planning process and developed a new five-year strategic plan. When we began that process, the first thing we did was try to understand as best we could the external context, how it had changed, what the threats were to democracy, what uh, new approaches were needed to counter those threats, to protect democracy, to advance it and its goals. Um, we concluded that uh, really the world that we are forced to work in has changed as much uh, in the last few years as it has since this organization was created in 1987. Since that time, since the end of the Cold War, until today, or until recently, there was a sense of an inexorable march of democracy, that there's no stopping it, that countries one after another would fall from the authoritarian camp into the democratic camp, and once in the democratic camp would march forward uh, on a path of democratic growth. Windy and bumpy at times perhaps, but still an uh, inexorable path. Uh, in the last few years, and, and supported uh, very strongly by governments like the United States, uh, governments like Sweden, uh, as well as uh, organizations like IFAS. In the past few years, though, that has changed. We've all seen democratic backsliding around the world, uh, countries like Hungary and Thailand. We've seen some countries go backwards from being democratic into being full-fledged authoritarian dictatorships, like in Venezuela now. There are many reasons for these changes, but I'll cite just two. First, the work of malign foreign actors, ones that are trying to undermine the Western liberal order that has been steadily constructed since the end of World War II, not with any positive agenda, but just simply to create havoc. And I think we know uh, here we're looking at Russia. Another uh, malign foreign actor that has been trying not just to challenge U.S. power, but the international system and global values that have guided work of the international community since the end of the Cold War uh, in offering an alternative, in, and they've been seeking to offer an alternative to democratic government. And here, of course, I'm referring to Chinese activities. Um, the second big change has been the impact of technology on democracy and elections, and in particular, the weaponization of technology. Technology used to track and monitor and harass and intimidate and jail democratic activists and political opponents. Social media used to spread false information and sow dissension in societies and cyber intrusion to, into a country's elections infrastructure to interfere with election administration and to undermine a population's faith in the integrity of their country's elections. 
These threats to democracy have grown dramatically, but the world has not responded in kind. The world has been too slow to recognize the growth of these threats and the impact of them on democratic society. Uh, citizens who have believed in the inexorable march of democracy have been lulled over the years into a sense of complacency and have not responded with the foresight or fortitude necessary to beat back the challenges. IFAS's work now is more important than it's ever been. Increasingly, we have seen awareness of this new context by governments, by think tanks, academics, uh, organizations like IFAS, but we have not seen that awareness translated into action. We have uh, seen enough examples of this uh, Sorry, uh, this is where IFAS's new strategic plan comes into to play. This is uh, the whole central idea behind IFAS's strategic plan, is for us to do our part, to get out ahead of the curve, to innovate, to develop new programmatic tools to counter those threats. And as a result, uh, as, and as part of our strategic planning process, we've come up with a new mission for the organization. And the mission is quite simply, together we build democracies that deliver for all. Build democracies, because technically sound elections and democracy in name are not enough. When political opposition is undermined by state control of the media, when there is illicit funding for pro-government parties, when there are, is police and judicial harassment of political opponents, then well-run elections and in the patina of a democratic system can in fact give undeserved legitimacy to autocratic rulers clinging to power. Uh, our mission is democracies that deliver for all. Why deliver for all? Because a democracy that fails to meet the basic aspirations of its people, a democratic architecture without results that the people desperately need and expect is a government that will not only lose the faith of its people, but r risk that though their citizens will lose faith in the very institution of democracy in that society. Lastly, though, together, together we do this. Uh, IFAS cannot do it alone. As Katie from Facebook said uh, in the earlier launch of Technology for Democracy, these threats demand new approaches, new partnership, new innovation, new way of thinking, new approaches. And IFAS is uh, firmly committed to working in partnership with the National Democrat Institute with the International Republican Institute are close partners for more than 15 years with whom we work in over 40 countries. Um, we are committed to working with our existing partners like NDI, new partners like Facebook, and we look forward to new partnerships with other organizations in this room. This is IFAS's new mission and what we'll be working tirelessly to achieve in the years to come. There are many challenges ahead and history has not yet been written. The cause of democracy will certainly suffer setbacks in the years to come. The road forward may be rough and windy at times, but I am very optimistic. And there are many reasons for this optimism. Most of all, because of human aspirations and what democracy offers to humankind. Also because of individuals around the world who are struggling and fighting and sacrificing for democratic ideals like we have seen recently on the streets in Hong Kong and Cairo just these past few days. And because of all of you in this room who have joined together with IFAS to express our common commitment to democracy and to pay tribute to three of its great champions. I'd l now like to make a few remarks about our first winner tonight, or winner, uh, recipient of our <laughs> winner, it's not a lottery, uh, our first awardee. Um, I am, uh, it's, it's honestly not a lottery. Um, I am, uh, <laughs> um, there, <laughs> 
If it were, there are certainly no more deserving people than the three awardees uh, this evening. I'm ex extremely proud to know Steve Hadley and to have worked with and for him as the Senior D Director for Democracy, Human Rights, and International Operations in the George W. Bush National Security Council. Steve is the quintessential national security professional who rose, of course, to the position of National Security Advisor. More important than his title, though, is the manner in which he conducted his work uh, then and to this day. Steve is unfailingly principled, dignified, and professional. Steve is the kind of person, and we all know people like this, who there's literally nothing you could do. There's no inducement that you could offer him that he would accept to compromise his integrity or ethics. Can't always say that these days. When citizens entrust their government officials with the awesome responsibility of governing, they hope and expect that those officials will have the integrity and character and commitment that Steve has. Working under a leader like Steve, as I was fortunate enough to do at the NHC, it's not just inspiring, but it's infectious. Other people follow that lead. Leadership like that is truly infectious. In government and since he left, Steve has shown an unwavering commitment to democracy and its promise even while recognizing its challenges. In an appearance before a Senate Appropriations Subcommittee in May of 2017, Steve observed that nations operating on democratic principles are better able to manage internal conflict so that it does not become violent and tear apart families, undercut economic progress and development, and spark international violence. That is why programs to advance justice, security, and rule of law in fragile states, to foster inclusive societies, and to promote free and fair elections unfettered by electoral violence are so critical. Steve was also raising the alarm bell about the shortcomings of democracy before many others. In that same subcommittee hearing, he said, certainly part of the problem is that democratic governments have in too many cases failed to deliver. We must recognize that a major factor has been the emergence of an active campaign by authoritarian governments to discredit democratic principles. They offer alternative models of governance based on nationalism, authoritarianism, and state capitalism as better able to provide stability, security, and well-being for their people. And he goes on to warn, America's response to these developments has been inadequate. We are currently losing the global struggle between democratic values and authoritarianism. It turns out that all that work that my colleagues at IFAS did in analyzing the external context and threats to democracy, all we had to do was read Steve's testimony to the Senate Appropriations Committee. We could have saved a lot of work. He said exactly, uh, he described exactly the context that we are trying to confront now uh, when he testified back in 2017. Since Steve left government, he has continued his public service in a myriad of ways, including through the service on the boards of organizations such as the Atlanta Council, where he serves as executive vice chair, and the U.S. Institute for Peace, headed by my uh, friend uh, Nancy Limborg, who is here, and where Steve chairs uh, the board. So please join me in congratulating Steve Hadley as being the recipient of one of IFAS's Charles T. Minot Democracy Awards. Good evening, everyone. I'm very grateful for this award, and I'm particularly pleased to be sharing the stage with my good friend, Secretary Madeleine Albright, and with former Swedish Foreign Minister Wallstrom. Both are true champions of freedom and democracy. And I'm very proud and pleased and honored to be part of this event tonight, recognizing the extraordinary work of this organization. What you do today 
day in and day out, could never be more important. For democracy is, today is under attack as never before. We tend to forget that democracy is an experiment, and a fairly recent experiment at that. After a brief golden age in Greece, it was only with the founding of the United States that democracy came into full flower more than 250 years ago. During the intervening 2,000 years, authoritarianism was overwhelmingly the norm, and the odds were largely against the new American Republic. For while most every other nation was founded on the basis of a common language, an accepted culture, or a shared ethnic identity, America was not. It was formed on the basis of a set of principles, freedom, democracy, human rights, and rule of law. Enshrined in its founding documents, embraced by its citizens, and attracting immigrants from all over the world who just wanted to become Americans and share in these principles. But our founders believed that these principles were not just for Americans, but reflected the aspirations of men and women around the world. So these principles became the foundation of the rules-based international order that America and Europe created in the aftermath of World War II after the defeat of fascism. And after the end of the Cold War and the collapse of communism, we thought they were now the only model on which modern societies would be organized. And we were wrong. A revanchist Russia and a surging China are offering the world an alternative model of nationalism, authoritarianism, and state capitalism. To many, this model appears to provide more effective governance in delivering the stability, security, and well-being people crave. By contrast, the results of the so-called Arab Spring have led many to equate democracy with chaos. And the disarray in the UK over Brexit and America's own political dysfunction have gone a long way to discredit two of the world's oldest and most established democracies. So what is to be done? It begins here at home. The world associates democratic principles with America's political and economic success. If America is form performing well, these principles are vindicated. If America is not delivering for its people, these principles are called into question. So the first thing we must do is show that our political system can overcome division solve problems and set policies that transcend administrations, and that our econ economic system can produce inclusive, sustained economic growth benefiting all Americans. Second, we must recognize that we are in an ideological competition with a new brand of authoritarianism, and we need to get in the game. With our democratic friends and allies in Europe, Asia, and elsewhere, we need to defend our democratic systems at home from external intervention and disruption and support those seeking to advance the cause of freedom and democracy abroad. And what does this mean for IFAS? Double down on your work advancing the cause of freedom and fair elections and continue your adaptation of that work to meet the new challenges that Tony was talking about, cyber, intrusion, disinformation, hate speech, corruption, the challenge of social media and technology. But you need to move beyond defending and promoting democratic elections to defending and promoting democratic governance. It's one thing to focus on elections when there's a global consensus in favor of democracy. That is no longer the world in which we live. We all need to make the case for why societies based on freedom, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law are better at meeting the aspirations of their people, providing long-term prosperity and security, and ensuring peace at home and abroad. 
And that case needs to be made here at home and abroad. APHIS, working with its impressive network of partners, can make an enormous contribution here. And the situation is, we face is challenging, but it is far from without hope. It is remarkable that with the authoritarianism seemingly on the march today, people are still demanding their freedom and calling for democracy. And as Tony mentioned, you only have to look at what's happening in Al Algeria, Sudan, Moldova, Slovakia, Hong Kong, even within Russia itself. People have to fight and win their own freedom. But we can help, and they deserve our help, and it's in our interest to give it. Thank you very much. In the pantheon of post-Cold War democracy heroes, Madeleine Albright will forever loom large. The combination of Secretary Albright's record of achievement and personal qualities make her truly unique. Frankly, it's hard to know what to admire more, her absolute unwavering commitment to freedom and democracy, the steeliness with which she stared down dictators like Slobodan Milosevic, or the humorous delight she could hardly conceal when putting an authoritarian, authoritarian despot in his place. And mind you, it was, of course, always a heat. It is well known that Secretary Albright has served as an inspiration for people around the world yearning to throw off the shackles of tyranny and, and oppression. It is perhaps, though, less well recognized how much of an inspiration that she has been for legions of national security professionals, including myself, and I know many, many in this room. People who believe deeply in the ideals of democracy, who believe those ideals are our greatest strength, and who fervently want our country to always remain true to them. Secretary Albright is also an inspiration to young people, especially students at Georgetown University where she teaches. There's a table of 10 Georgetown students here tonight who somehow concluded that they had a better chance of getting close and hearing Secretary Albright by coming to a $500 a play charity dinner than being able to get off the wait list on her classes, which are impossible to access if you've ever uh, talked to a Georgetown student about it. Uh, Secretary Albright is legitimately famous for many things, and uh, none of them are scandalous, which is also quite an accomplishment in Washington. <laughs> She is known around the world as a passionate advocate for democracy and especially for citizens' rights to choose the people who will govern them. And she carries the message tirelessly, most notably as chair of the National Democratic Institute, again, our, our close partner. Her most recent book, Fascism, A Warning, is getting a lot of attention and for good reason. First, it's just a great read, deeply insightful, rich with history, page turner, and I especially like this part, replete with expressions of Secretary Albright's wry, wry humor. More importantly though, it, exactly, it is exactly what it says it is. It's a warning. A warning that the march of democracy is not inevitable, that authoritarians can ascend to power and democratic systems can be eroded while citizens stand idly by until it is too late, or worse, they actively go along with the surrender of democratic rights in pursuit of some narrow and ultimately selfish goal. If anyone asked me why I thought IFAS should expand our mission from one focus primarily on elections to one focus primarily on democracy, I'll simply tell them to read Secretary Albright's book. In it, she writes, to a small d Democrat, process matters more than ideology. The fairness of an election is more important than who wins. 
Concerns only arise when leaders try to augment their power through means that could cause permanent damage to democratic institutions. Frankly, reading this book is also a bit terrifying. As Secretary Albright recounts the descent of societies into some of 20th century's worst fascist dictatorships. The reader cannot avoid recognizing the similarities of some of what we are witnessing in different parts of the world today. Indeed, that is, of course, one of the main points. But in the end, the book is ultimately uplifting for the hope and optimism it offers the reader and the world a fundamental belief in freedom, democracy, and humankind. Secretary Albright writes about the capacity of an ordinary person living with extraordinary stress to feel empathy toward men and women she has never met and to seek, <laughs> to seek comfort in the conviction that all humans are of equal worth. She gives the reader strength and conviction when she reminds us that the generosity of spirit, this caring about others and about the proposition that we are all created equal is the single most important antidote to the self-centered moral numbness that allows fascism to thrive. Please join me in congratulating Secretary Madeleine K. Albright on her receipt of the IFAS Charles T. Minot Democracy Award. also the shortest person speaking. Um, thank you very much, Tony, for your kind words and uh, for taking on this critical leadership role at IFAS and um, for all the kind words that you said, but all the things that you are doing. I'm honored to receive the Charles Manat Democracy Award. In addition to his long association with IFAS, Chuck was the founding chair of the National Democratic Institute. And, um, <laughs> I was the vice chair at the time, and I have to admit that when it all began, neither Chuck nor I had any clue of what we were supposed to be doing. Um, one program led to another, and today I'm very proud to say that NDI is working in more than 70 countries as part of a global democracy movement that obviously includes our friendship and partnership with IFAS, and I'm delighted to be here with our new president, Derek Mitchell. Uh, Chuck would be very proud of what we've accomplished, and I know we all miss him very much tonight. And I'm delighted to share the evening with tonight's other award recipients, both of whom are dear friends, dedicated public servants, and staunch defenders of democracy. A lot of people around Washington seem to think that Steve Hadley and I have superhuman powers. Uh, because whenever there is an intractable foreign policy problem, Steve and I get asked to lead a bipartisan commission to deal with it. In, 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 uh, in, in just the past few years, we have looked at the challenges in the Middle East and the problems of extremism in fragile states. And I cannot say we've solved much of anything, but we really have learned an awful lot. We have also proven that it is still possible for Democrats and Republicans to work together and even be friends, although I'm not sure that Steve wants me to say that publicly. But really, uh, it is a wonderful friendship. Yeah. I have also very much enjoyed partnering with Minister Margot Wallstrom, who has been an incredible leader on women's issues and international democracy work. As you all know, Margot recently announced that she was stepping down after a long and distinguished tenure as Sweden's foreign minister. So tonight, it is my pleasure to officially induct you into one of the world's most exclusive clubs of former foreign ministers. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, there is actually a group of us that meets regularly under the auspices of the Aspen Institute. Uh, 
Its official name is the Aspen Ministers Forum. Its unofficial name is Madeline and her exes. Uh, so, Margot, I would be delighted if you would become one of the exes and uh, um, to have you part of that. In all seriousness, I think it says something very right that IFAS has chosen to honor leaders from across the political spectrum and both sides of the Atlantic. It reminds us that the commitment to democratic development is both international and bipartisan, and that's important because the work of building and sustaining democracies requires persistence and it requires cooperation. Since its founding more than 30 years ago, IFAS has brought both of these attributes to the fight for freedom, and its dedicated staff have deployed around the world, often in austere and dangerous locations, to help countries prepare for and run elections. And they work quietly behind the scenes, putting in very long hours and navigating difficult political environments, and they make a profound difference. I have seen this firsthand, because for more than 20 years, IFAS and NDI have partnered together with the International Republican Institute to strengthen election administrations and political processes. With support from USAID, we have built a consortium, SEPS, that serves as the preeminent source for expertise, assistance in democracy, human rights, and governance. And as a joint body, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. The consortium operates in 140 countries and has issued 475 subgrants and delivers on the democratic promise by working with civic organizations, women's organizations, political parties, and elected bodies. Recent models of success include collaborating to decrease tensions and to mitigate crisis in Kenya's elections, introducing an assessment tool in Georgia's elections to gauge whether the state deployed resources in a manner consistent with its authorities, and the tool has since been used in other contexts to boost transparency and help the electoral playing field, to really level it. <clears throat> so just this past weekend, IFAS and NDI and IRI collaborated to support local civil society organizations in Afghanistan, where brave citizens exercise their democratic rights in the face of constant threats by the Taliban. <clears throat> I'm very proud of the collaboration between our organizations, and I believe it must continue to deepen in the future. Because in this interconnected and interdependent world, democratic progress is inseparable from democratic cooperation. And while there's no question that democracy today is facing stiff headwinds, we also know that the desire for democratic government remains deep and wide. Yes, many are dissatisfied, but the goal of most is to make democracy work better not to abandon the framework of freedom. And we all discuss, and since there are students here, and I have to point to one of my best students, Nancy Soderberg, who was <laughs> with me in the 1980s. She made it. Um, uh, so, but I think always the discussions are whether economic or political development go together. They, they do go together. They have to go together because people, democracy has to deliver because people want to vote and eat. So I think we have to think about that. So we celebrate this organization and all it has accomplished, and let us also pledge tonight, as a community of small d Democrats, that we will never grow tired, never stop striving to fulfill our ideals, and never stop working together to make freedom a reality for our own citizens and for people everywhere. Thank you all very much for this great honor. Thank you so very much, Secretary Albright. You truly do 
honor us with your, your presence here tonight, together with Steve and, and Margot, the three of you. I'm, I'm so grateful to all three of you uh, whom I've had the pleasure, each of you, working with in, in different contexts, and so grateful to you for being here tonight. This is, uh, I promise, the last time you're going to hear from me tonight, uh, and, but you are in for a real special treat later in the evening when the three awardees will be joined by Bruce Jones, Vice President of Brookings and Director of the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings for a moderated discussion. And you'll be able to hear straight from our awardees on uh, their uh, a conversation with them about their thoughts in an um, unscripted way about some of the challenges to democracy. Um, I first got to know Margot Wallstrom when she was appointed by the UN Secretary General as the first ever special representative for uh, sexual, on sexual violence in conflict. Very soon after, that was in 2010, very soon, and I was working in the, the United Nations at the, the time, uh, and very soon after Margot arrived, she made a trip to Eastern DRC. Uh, and she returned to New York and mesmerized the Security Council, galvanized her role, and earned a very dedicated and loyal follow group of followers in the United Nations and uh, among its member states because of the passion she brought to the issue after she returned from Congo. Uh, she has had a very distinguished career before and after her service in the United Nations. Far too many notable accomplishments to uh, go through, but I'd like to highlight a few. Uh, Margot served as the European Commissioner for the Environment from 1999 to 2004 and was a very early and strong advocate for the health of our planet and against global warming. After Dutch and French voters in 2005 rejected the idea of a European constitution. Uh, as first vice president of the European Commission, uh, Margot pushed for a plan D, and D for democracy, dialogue, and debate to reconnect citizens of the European Union with the Union itself. In November 2007, Margot Wallstrom became chair of the Council of Women World Leaders Ministerial Initiative. Why is that so interesting? That position was previously held by Secretary Albright. Uh, of course, uh, Margot Wallstrom was Minister of Foreign Affairs from October 2014 until uh, this very month. And among the very many things that she has earned great credit and recognition for is the establishment of a feminist foreign policy. Uh, this concept, Margot's the originator of it, and this concept was initially derided by, by many uh, practitioners, commenter, uh, commentators, and others. Now it's being repeated, uh, replicated, copied in countries around the world, not just in Europe, but well beyond. And that's a sign of true visionary leadership when your ideas are first fought like that, but then adopted and become mainstream. Now, even with all the accolades won by our other two awardees and many other people in this room, there's one that I'm quite sure no one else has won in this room or probably in their country. But in December 2006, Margot Wallström was voted the most popular woman in Sweden. So, uh, I mean, right? More recently, Margot Wallström, like Secretary Albright in her book and like Steve Hadley before the Senate and in other fora, has been talking about democracy and warning about threats to democracy. In February of this year, she appeared before the Swedish parliament and made the statement of foreign policy, the official foreign policy statement by the government of Sweden to the parliament. And in it, she warned, nationalists and extremists are challenging political systems across our continent, across the world. Those of us who have faith in the future must now rally together to fight insecurity. Minister Wallstrom went on to set out three foreign policy priorities for the Swedish government, the first among them being democracy. 
She noted democracy's decline, pointed to the harassment and killing of elected representatives, journalists, and human rights defenders, the poisoning of public debate by agitation and hate, and how people are losing confidence in the democratic system. She then boldly informed the Swedish parliament, in response to these developments, we, Sweden, the Swedish government, we are now launching a drive for democracy. And she committed that our democracy drive will be reflected in all areas of our foreign policy. When others around the world were anguishing about what to do to defend democracy, Margo Wallström, with vision and conviction, put herself in Sweden at the very forefront of the battle to advance equality, to guard our freedoms, to promote democracy. Please join me in congratulating Margo Wallström as a recipient of this year's IFIS Charles T. Pinot Democracy Award. speech writer any longer, so uh, <laughs> to make my own speech. Thank you very much. For sure, we live in difficult times. And uh, I'm often reminded about that old ancient story about the grandfather who tells uh, his grandchild um, a bed story, the bed story about the two wolves and the grandfather says that within every person there are two wolves that fight for, for space. One wolf is um, uh, the evil uh, wolf, the bad wolf, the black one who uh, represents violence and hatred and revenge and all those um, emotions that, um, uh, that are negative. And the other is um, the good wolf, the wolf that, um, that represents instead love and compassion um, and uh, being a true human being. And of course, in the end, the grandchild asks, but grandpa, which wolf wins? And he says, the one you feed. I really think that is for me to say thank you to all of you for everything that you are doing to fight for democracy, to fight for, for the good, because I feel we live in a time when it is a kind of fight between good and evil. And um, I thank you for uh, giving me this award unexpectedly, and of course being in the, in, in the same group uh, uh, as uh, Madeleine Albright and Steve Hadley, it's such an honor, uh, unexpected honor, and I don't know if I'm worthy at all, but I really want to thank you instead and thank IFES for everything you're doing, because it, it means something, what we do. And that's why I actually made a to-do list to, uh, for all of you to, to take with you. Um, I think that we, are, we need to create or um, formulate a modern story of the strength of democracy to strengthen the norm, to strengthen the democratic norm. Countries who are democratic are less corrupt, more free, they are richer, they are more globalized, they are more altruistic. This is what we know from experience and from from, from science or from uh, knowledge. I think we need to create um, and find allies in this work. And why not appoint more ambassadors? We have uh, appointed an ambassador in Sweden that works on, on democracy, on human rights, and, uh, and the rule of law. I think we need to be more operational. What are the actions that are needed to defend our democracy, including defending free media? Uh, and you know this quote also, first they came for the journalists, 
We don't know what happened after that. I think we need resources. As with everything else, we need a budget to work for democracy as well and defend the democratic principles. So make sure that in, in the budgets there is also uh, money for, for, for this. We, of course, need more women. Uh, we need... Uh, <laughs> we need more young people uh, that help us fight for democracy. So, so congratulations to the students that are here because you are the very important people in this room. And this is also the reason why I launched what we call the Feminist Foreign Policy in 2014 uh, when we took office. And it is nothing mysterious about that. It's a very practical thing and a very practical knowledge. We know that there will be more peace with more women and a more lasting peace around the world if women are included in negotiating peace agreements and keeping peace as, as well. And it is... <laughs> and it is guided by three... Uh, parameters, three R's. It's about rights, checking on if women and girls enjoy the same human and legal rights as, as men. Uh, it's about representation. Are they, do they have a seat around the table? Do we listen to their voices when important decisions are being made that include also them? And thirdly, it's about resources. Um, are the budgets also uh, to fulfill there to fulfill the needs of, of women and girls. Now, we also have to live by example. And I think that that includes also working for equality, as we've heard, uh, economic uh, and, and gender equality. Because if democracy does not deliver, and we've already heard that argument, then it is weakened uh, in the same, to the same extent. So, I would say we need a drive for democracy, and I hope I can count on you to work with us and that we will be allies in this important endeavor also in the future. Thank you so much for giving me this award, and I will join your club immediately, uh, Madeleine. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Earlier on in the celebration of our honorees, we had some food for the soul. You've had some nourishment. And so now we're going to turn to some food for thought. Turns out in this town, they say there's no free lunch in Washington. Turns out even when they give you an award, they make you work for your dinner. Uh, so I'm going to invite the honorees to join me on stage and we'll have a conversation about the state of democracy. While everybody is getting seated, let me just take one moment to thank Tony and IFAS for tonight's event and also to congratulate IFAS for securing Tony. Tony is one of the most... Uh, one of the most capable and energetic professionals I've ever worked with, so I think it's a great asset to have Tony back in town and working on this extremely important issue at this uh, esteemed and important institution. So Tony, congratulations to you. And congratulations to all of you, the honorees of tonight's, uh, tonight's award. Do you have a microphone as well? You do, good. Um, I told the, uh, our guests backstage that I was gonna start with what I think is actually a very difficult question. We know the situation in this town, we know the situation in several key democracies, we know the situation in international affairs, but we know the dark side. I asked them each to think about one issue where they see uh, hope or cause for optimism in the struggle for democracy. Steve, why don't you start? Well, I, I, I said in my remarks, and I think it's, it's astonishing in the era of authoritarianism and when everybody thought that the the Arab Spring was actually uh, an Arab winter. You have what's going on in Algeria and Sudan, and now some stirrings in Egypt. And it just makes the point that I, our founders believed that freedom and democracy, those principles on which our country was founded and which we share with our European friends and allies, 
do reflect the highest aspirations of the human p spirit. You just can't pe keep people down. And if they're given a chance for freedom and, and democracy, if they have a chance to vote with their feet, they will vote for freedom and democracy every time. And that is the hope. And we, I think, are, are a little bit, we have a, a crisis of confidence uh, within uh, our, our country with respect to freedom and democracy. And to quote my friend Madeleine Albright, she says, it's time for us to renew our vows <laughs> to the principles on which this nation was founded because they're still right. And if you don't believe it, look around at what's happening in the world, even in a time of authoritarianism. Well said, Madeline. Um, well, um, Tony was very kind to push my book. Um, and, and I have said that there is never a book written or a speech given that doesn't quote Robert Frost. So a quote that I like of Robert Frost is, the older I am, the younger are my teachers. And I really do believe that the hope is in the young people, not just the students over there, but the young people that were out marching for climate change and Greta who gets up and starts really, many of us have spoken from that uh, stage at the, in the General Assembly and you know the kinds of things that the young people are saying and doing. And I think um, in, in the United States, those that marked against, uh, marched against the killing, the Parkland kids, and I really do think that our hope are, is in the young people. All right, well said, sir. <clears throat> and the women. <laughs> nice, very well done. <laughs> I, I, because I had uh, at the UN, and for those two years that I worked uh, uh, as a special representative on conflict-related sexual violence, I found it, it left me, I often say, with a heavier heart, but also paradoxically with more hope for the future because I met with all of those women who refuse to give up and who doesn't want to, they don't want to be victims only, but they really want to be fully agents for change and they want to influence their own future and they want to do it in a democratic way. So I think I, my answer would have been exactly what, what Madeleine said also, young people and women, they, because they have not been given uh, sort of the, the full influence that they deserve in, in decision making and in our democracies. So there's still a role for them to fulfill. Terrific. I'm going to return to all of these themes. Um, I'm going to ask you now, all of you, the same question. I'm going to ask it in two parts and feel free to pick one part or the other or both. It seems to me if we think about the way in which the United States and the West has sought to advance democracy over the last 30 years, supporting young democracies, providing assistance to young democracies, isolating governments that were rolling backwards, naming and shaming, the whole series of techniques that you've all used in your careers, mediation and other things. But that was in a context where governments didn't really have anywhere else to go but the West uh, in, in real terms. That's changing, and it's changing fast. You talked about it in your comments. We're in a space now where China provides a huge amount of economic space and increasingly political space. Russia can provide you other kinds of things if you want them. How is that going to change how the United States and how the West thinks about its role in trying to advance and preserve democracy in international affairs? Well, actually, America first will mean a second in the, in the bigger picture. China will uh, um, pass uh, um, the US uh, in, in very many aspects if, if you don't change course. Uh, and I think, uh, unfortunately, they do not help when it comes to furthering democracy, of course, to the Chinese. So uh, I think that we really have to think carefully about uh, how to uh, weigh this and how to uh, act uh, also against uh, China. But we have no other option than to uh, work together on, on the democratic principles. And we have to defend them every day because it's actually also how you speak about, uh, it's about tolerance, tolerance of the opposition. And I think a lot about that, that we see so much of polarization today that is that, that is hurting our, our democracies. Because we have to tolerate the opposition, we have to work with them, we have to even uh, be friends uh, uh, sometimes, but um, even though we have very different political views. And instead of starting to call each other 
uh, bad names, we, we have to work together and, and defend the democratic principles. And, and among these are uh, tolerance of, of the opposition. So um, I, I think we are facing a, a very different uh, world order and we have to stand up for, for democracy and help each other. I think we have to understand, and you said this also, that democracy is hard. Um, it is a process. It is not uh, a, ever a finished product, and it's the journey. And I think it's not a spectator sport. I think that um, what we have seen is that there are periods that are chaotic. I always talk about um, an analysis of the Arab Spring. So what happens, social media gets the people to go to Tahrir Square. They get there, they don't have a clue what to do. The thing that, last thing for me to say, but I believe the elections were held too soon. And so the Muslim Brotherhood is organized, the people in Tahrir Square are not, um, and Cairo is a mess. Then I make up this uh, middle-aged guy who lives outside of Cairo and wants to come in in order to open his stall in the souk, and it's a mess in Cairo, and he says, to hell with this, I want order and now they have a military government. And so I think we haven't fully recognized how difficult democracy is. The other part, and I have tried very hard um, at NDI and generally to try to analyze what the problems have been. We were all euphoric after the end of the Cold War. Um, Central and East, as somebody was born in Czechoslovakia that used to be a democracy during the, the only one in Central Europe in the interwar period and had Václav Havel as a president, why wouldn't it be a democracy right away? The bottom line is I think our problem is that we deal with elites in these countries and we have not dealt enough with what, quote, the hardworking people of X country want. We have not understood the power of, or the disruptive aspect of technology um, or the militarization of information. And I think we need a little bit of humility in trying to sort out how we move forward because I believe we're all the same and people do want to make decisions about their own lives. And so we have oxymoron terms like illiberal democracy or authoritarian capitalism. Um, and I think we, you can't impose democracy. And so I think we need to be a little more humble and try to figure out, and whoever said it isn't just elections, it is the rule of law. It is um, a variety of different things. And I think those of us that care, which is everybody in this room in addition of others, is I think we have to be, try to figure out what went wrong. Something went wrong. Um, and um, I was just in the Czech Republic. Um, and so I, f I find it, depressing beyond belief and what's happened in Hungary and Poland. And so I think we need to um, really work with our partners to try to figure out where we can get at the problem of democracy not delivering to everybody. And authoritarians always have some one answer. They are stable geniuses. Um, and so uh, one of the things in my book, I, I did go back and try to figure out what happens and the best quotes in my book are from Mussolini as the first fascist. And um, the best quote is his. Uh, if you pluck a chicken one feather at a time, nobody notices. So there's a lot of feather plucking going on everywhere. And by the way, you can't say those two words together too quickly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, Steve, that's a bit of a hard act to follow, but. <laughs> Madeline is always a hard act to follow. <laughs> so a couple quick points. One, I think we can um, conclude too quickly that the future belongs to China. China, everybody says China is so strategic and takes the long view. I would tell you that I think Xi Jinping made a huge strategic mistake. He abandoned the policy of hide and bide about five or ten years too soon. And he woke up a sleeping dragon, and it wasn't the Chinese, it was the American people. And I think you're gonna see now, we're, we're, we've gone through a period of strategic surprise, uh, and then strategic panic. We didn't have a policy in China, it was kind of pushback on China everywhere. I think you're now starting to see us coming up with a strategy, beginning to address the issues we need to do so we can compete in an effective way with China. 
But on the issue you raised, I think the most important thing we can do is fix our democracy yeah. here at home. Yes. If you go out with democracy, <laughs> if you go out with democracy promotion and we do not show the world we have an effective democracy here at home, you'll look like a hypocrite and you will have no impact. So the most important thing we in Europe can do is fix our own democracies have inclusive democracy that work. We, all, we really know how to solve social security. We know how to solve immigration. We know how to solve the, the problems of infrastructure. We're just not doing it. Our political system is not performing. So the first thing we need to do is get our own political s systems to perform. Because our, the most powerful tool for advancing the cause of democracy is the effective functioning of our own states and being an example for people. Yes, we need to continue to democracy promotion. We need to, as Jesse Jackson once said in, in 1984 at convention, we need to keep hope alive. We need to keep that example out there for those people Madeline has talked about who are struggling for freedom and democracy and can see a society that works and that they want to emulate in their own. That's where we have to start. One of the things when um, we, I was talking about Cairo and Egypt, uh, NDI was in there, and we were telling people that there needed to be coalition building and compromise, and one of the um, members of parliament said, you mean like you guys? <laughs> no. So it's exactly what Steve was saying. Barbara, you had a comment. No, I, I, this is exactly my to-do list has to do with, with that. We have to uh, live according to what we preach uh, to others. And, but one thing that I have noticed also in this country, at big rallies, um, journalists are sort of fenced in, and s speakers point to them and accuse them of uh, spreading fake news or what have you. This is, this is the beginning of, of the end of uh, a free media uh, s situation where journalists will be allowed to do their job. This is extremely dangerous, because what happens next? And as, as, as much as we can be critical of, of some of the journalism and, of course, about what the, what the journalists write, but the minute that you diminish uh, the possibility for journalists to do their job and, and you're not allowing free media or calling them names, then we are on a slippery slope. It's true. And, and this <coughs> is not only here. I mean, 80 journalists are killed every year for just doing their job. So but we have to recognize that one of the things that uh, is reflected in the Brexit vote and the election of President Trump and the rise of the parties on the right and the left is that the elites, people like us in this room, including the media, lost contact with a good chunk of our people. People who, you know, I say feel that they have been uh, victimized by globalization, uh, betrayed by their politicians, ignored by the elites and are threatened by immigration. That group of people uh, are what produce these effects. And so we all have some soul searching to do, including the media, to find out to, how, to, how to, you know, reconnect with what in some sense we used to call the other America. We have another other America problem like we did in the 60s. And we've got to address it. So I want to pick up on a theme that sort of connects that to something that Madeline said, which is about technology. Because all of those themes are ameliorated by technology in one way and amplified by technology in another. Earlier on, you launched the, the, the new project on technology for democracy, and we talked about the empowering options and the empowering uh, power of technology. We've also seen negative uh, elements of technology, and I think we're watching something very dangerous, which is the adaptation of technologies by authoritarian states to substantially improve their degree of social control. So I, for each of you, how do you think about the technology question in this fight? How, sort of where are you optimistic, pessimistic? How do you see the, the, the issue? Well, I am... Um at the moment, I'm somewhat pessimistic because we admire technology without, it's always your term about admiring a problem rather than trying to deal with it. And I think we haven't understood enough of the disruption of it. And if we think that the amount of technology that we have now is an issue, wait till artificial intelligence um, is there and robots are doing the job. And 
um, all the various aspects. And I think we need to learn the mistakes we made on not recognizing that technology was basically a revolution and what it did to people's sense of dignity about being connected to their work and what it means for society. And I think on the to-do list is one of those things of trying to recognize the disruptions and recognize that the next wave is going to be even more complicated. And to try to have discussions, I actually, I hate to say this to you, I don't like the word tolerance because that's put up with. I think what we need to do is respect other people's views and have conversations with them to try to figure out what it is that they're thinking about. Why are they thinking that way? I think one of the hardest things to do, because I've tried it, is to actually talk to people with whom you totally disagree and also to listen to things that you disagree with. Um, you should be glad you don't live in Washington because I drive and listen to right-wing radio that makes me fairly crazy. Uh, but I think it's important to try to figure out what's going on and try to get um, us thinking ahead in terms of um, what we need to do with the next wave, which is going to be even more complicated. And, and I, I so agree with what you're saying in terms of women, but the question is what do people do? Uh, because people identify themselves with what their work is, and if there isn't work, or some robot is driving the truck, uh, what is it that you do? And I don't think we've thought through the next wave of it enough, which then is also linked to cyber issues. Um, and the combination of AI and cyber, I think, is something we are not prepared to deal with yet. You know, I, I started out thinking <clears throat> this explosion of technology and social media was going to be hugely democratizing and empowering individuals to take more cons responsibility and make control of the futures. Uh, and I did not anticipate the extent to which, particularly the Chinese, would, would stay with it, figure it out, and turn it into a vehicle for social control. And this social credit system that the Chinese are talking about, where they keep a score on people in terms of their credit and their, their, their various activities, what they say on their social media, and then parcel out <coughs> benefits like where your child gets into school based on your show, social credit score is a device that Joseph Stalin would have loved to have had. So, you know, we're in a, I, I think though, what I would ask is, we may be in one of these things where we used to have in the arms control world, offense and defense competitions. So we thought, the democracy it was going to be a, 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 a tool for democracy. It's now become a tool for authoritarians. What's the next round? And you're beginning to see this with um, various programs that give you the kind of end-to-end -end encryption that even governments cannot penetrate. So it may be that the next wave of technology will begin to be subversive once again of governments. I think this is going to be a, a, a long tail cycle, and we don't really know where it's going to end up. You're bringing out your inner Marxist Hegelian, Steve. <laughs> but I, I think we were, we were too slow to, uh, to use modern technology for, for furthering uh, democracy. So we should have been much better in using it as a democratic tool because it is also fantastic. I think we're the wrong generation to actually talk about this. No like question you ask about young that. young people, they say, what a fantastic uh, uh, tool this is and, and what sort of knowledge, uh, how knowledge is spread uh, through, uh, of course, through social media and, and modern technology, information technology. So it's always what you turn it into and how you use it. And I actually remember the millennium bug. You remember that? Yes. When the world was uh, supposed to go under. Yep. Um, and uh, I remember being sort of uh, uh, having an emergency uh, uh, role in the European Union. Nothing happened. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And we were kind of waiting anxiously for planes to fall down and the stove not working or what have you. I was just complete. Where did that come from? Who created that that story? And I think it's a, I mean, every technology you have to decide. <laughs> you did? <laughs> it was probably Madeline, but. <laughs> Ma <coughs> Madeline and I know who did and we're not telling. <laughs> uh, I want to pull each of you out on one specific theme. Uh, Secretary Albright, um, 
Tony talked about your book, and I think Steve quite accurately talked about you as a kind of a, a, a long-standing warrior in the fight for, for democracy. In your book, it's a pretty stark book at parts, and you warn of the serious erosion of political institutions. And I want to ask you, are we hearing the lessons? Are we, are you seeing things that make you believe we're, we're coming to grips with some of the weakness inside our own institutions? I don't mean internationally, I mean here. I think actually we are beginning to here, but also abroad. And Steve mentioned some of the things that are, the protests that are taking place. I found very interesting there are protests in Hungary. Um, there are some in Poland. Um, <coughs> there are in Turkey. And so I think some of it is beginning to kind of dawn on people. Part of the problem is I think one can legitimately say, to go back to earlier, what is it that created this? And there really has been a division in societies, all of them, as a result of technology, the haves and have-nots. And, and I think that we did not pay enough attention to it early and the role of information and all that. But I do think, at the moment, there is beginning to be kind of a revolt. There were, today in the paper says there were demonstrations in Russia. Um, and so I do think the question is, and I don't have the answer to this, is what has happened is the demagogues are basically saying that these are colored revolutions that the United States has sponsored. And so we have to be careful not to fall into that trap because we're not sponsoring them. Um, but I do think there is beginning to be some recognition that this is not the direction to go in. And when I did my study of various, um, you know, what I found interesting, both in studying Mussolini and Hitler, they came to power constitutionally. Uh, King Emmanuel asked uh, Mussolini to take over and von Hindenburg asked uh, Hitler to. The others that I write about, whether it's Hungary or Poland or Turkey or the Philippines or Venezuela, et cetera, all those people were elected. And therefore, I think the issue of what happens in elections, where people get their information, is something that one can work on. And I think it is going to take a while. But we can't, the natural, my sense always was that um, I always hated it when people said, X people are not ready for democracy. We're all the same. And I remember people saying, Asians don't care about democracy. So I decided I would make a Korean American my assistant secretary for democracy. Um, and various things in terms of showing that this is not just a Western concept and that we need partners in other countries to look at the basic aspects of democracy. So, People often ask me if I'm an optimist or a pessimist. I'm an optimist who worries a lot. Um, <laughs> and I'm worried that we're not getting the message, that we're not doing the to-do lists. And you know, it's the see something, say something, do something. And I think we really ought to combine our to-do lists. Very good. Steve, on China. Uh, you talked about it in your remarks. You talked about it now. But I want to pull you out a little farther. Uh, your, I think, clear-eyed about the challenge that China poses, you're also not panicking, and you don't want to take us into a crazy new Cold War. You're also clear-eyed about the need to rally to defense of democracy and core principles and recommit. But there are going to be places where those are in serious tension. I'm thinking about Hong Kong. I'm thinking about Taiwan. There are a number of things you can see. So how do you think about navigating the tension between those two, two dynamics, both of which will be critical parts well. of international relations? We thought, <clears throat> I think, um, turns out wrongly in the 1990s and into the uh, first decade of the 21st century that China's political si system and ours were in a s gradually going to converge. The people who hand negotiated the handover of Hong Kong in 1979, that's what they thought. So that by 2049, the two systems would have converged and you know, there would, there, there would no longer be any separation because both Hong Kong would live inside a more open and democratic China. That's clearly not happening. And the situation, the two systems, I think, are uh, not converging and probably diverging. I do not believe that means we are fated to be adversaries and enter into confrontation, maybe conflict. I think those differences have to be recognized um, and we can live with those differences. That does not mean that we give up our promotion of, of freedom and democracy and human rights and rule of law. We ought to continue to be talking about those things. 
We have to be judicious about how we talk about them, but we should be standing up for those principles. But we have to recognize uh, there are limits and there are trade-offs, and Hong Kong is a very challenging thing. We all have great sympathy for what's going on in Hong Kong, and our, we all stand with those people who are demonstrating. But the reality is China is not going to allow what they believe outside powers to move Hong Kong away and tolerate a completely inconsistent political system in Hong Kong. And I think if necessary, they will crack down. That's just the reality. So we've got to be smart about this. We've got to stand for our principles. Um, we have to uh, not compromise in the face of China, but at the same time, recognizing there is business that we have to do with China uh, for, for um, in some sense, the good of both countries if we're going to cooperate on global issues. And we have to be careful on issues like Hong Kong and Taiwan, where there are a lot of competing considerations at stake. So we're in a, in a very perilous and difficult time. Margot, you talked about the role of women. When you were foreign minister, you committed Sweden to a feminist foreign policy. You also committed Sweden to the advance of democracy. Did you see those as two sides of the same coin? Were they different? How did you understand the relationship between those two? Yeah, because uh, gender equality uh, is uh, a part of, of democracy and the fight for democracy. Women make up half of the world's population and uh, uh, excluding them from uh, many of the peace processes or peace negotiations or um, sort of decision-making uh, bodies uh, uh, does not, uh, is not part of, of a democratic development. So it's very, very important. It belongs to foreign policy because, as I said, more women means more peace. We see that peace processes where women have been involved, they last longer. You get more options on the table to discuss. So this is uh, something we know from, from experience now. So those uh, processes have to be uh, uh, secured. And um, uh, to me, it's a matter of democracy. We have about a minute and a half left. I'm going to ask you each to have a brief comment on one final issue. Uh, we talked about what a popular Swedish woman you are. There's another quite popular Swedish woman called Greta Thunberg. Yeah, really How good. important is climate change? How important is climate change to uh, the ability of democracies to get climate change right? How important is that going to be for the future of democracy, both in our own countries and internationally? I'd like you to each comment. Well, in the end, um, I mean, the, we, we, we simply have to do this. We simply have to make sure that we um, adapt to climate change, because it's too late to say that we can mitigate it, but we, can, we must adapt to climate change. We will see it first and foremost in our part of the world and in, I would say, in the Arctic region, and it's like taking off your cap from your head uh, when the sun shines uh, very uh, brightly, uh, when the ice melts, and, and it is already happening. It's already happening, and we just uh, have to listen to somebody like Greta. And I think it's from the mouths of 15-year-olds that we hear uh, the truth, uh, finally. And also, she speaks truth to, to power, I would say. And um, I think she's an inspiration also. And everybody sees that it is not enough to just uh, uh, give a thumbs up uh, on social media, but you also have to take to the streets and show that this is a popular um, demand. And, and and look, look out for denying uh, science, because I find that that is also a very worrying uh, um, element in today's discussion. Um, to be a climate change um, denier, I, 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 it goes beyond my, uh, you know, it's just, sorry. But the science is united on this. The science is united. We've had so many consecutive reports from the IPCC, and everything they have predicted is happening. Everything has happened exactly, even worse, than what they have uh, written in their reports. So we have no choice. We just have to do this. And we can, it can give us also a better future. That's the thing. It, it can give us sustainable uh, uh, living conditions and, and a better economic and, and social uh, and environmental uh, world. I think what has to happen is for us to recognize that this is happening, but also try to figure out what can be done institutionally. 
Um, I think it was very good that the UN had a session on climate, uh, which was uh, matched by the street protests, so that that's out there. I think we also need to think about various subdivisions in our countries, whether it's states or cities, because they play a role. Um, and they have a very active aspect to it, and each uh, country has a somewhat different gov governmental system, but we don't always just have to look to the capital. And then I think we need to look to the private sector in terms of those that can actually um, do well by doing good uh, in terms of looking at products that in fact help. I mean, I've just been dealing with a company that can figure out through uh, solar panels how to get water out of the air and get enough water to some places uh, so that there's drinkable water. And for instance, so that the woman farmer in Kenya doesn't have to walk miles to get water and she can uh, have an education and do her business. And therefore, I think that we need to motivate the various sections of our society, whether it's national security to do with what's happening in the Arctic or the private sector or various subdivisions of the structure and the United Nations and the EU and the WTO, et cetera, to use the structures that we have. I have believed, frankly, that people and institutions at age 70 need a little refurbishing. And so I think we need to look at some of them in our terms of how they can participate in them. Steve, final word to you. So I'm late to the climate issue. I'm no expert on it, but I think actually the climate issue is going to show the strength of our democracy for the reason Madeline said. Yes, the federal government, the Trump administration wants to pull out of the Paris Climate Accord, but what's been very interesting is you see state governments and you see corporations and groups of corporations all saying, well, notwithstanding that, we are going to pursue policies that would allow us to meet our, con our goals and commitments under the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, and most kids I talk to, and I don't talk to a lot of them given my advanced age, but the ones I get a chance to, you know, they're all, they, they get the climate change thing. So I think uh, as they uh, participate more in the political system, I think our democracy actually is going to show its strength because it's going to make progress on this issue. And secondly, if you talk to Ernie Moniz, who was a physicist who was our, the department of, the head of the Department of Energy under President Obama, He's very confident about what technology is going to offer downstream. So, you know, I think it's good that there is a crisis uh, atmosphere on the climate issue because it's going to motivate people. But I think in the end of the day, our democratic institutions and the, our private sector, innovation and technology, we're going we're to figure this out. And we need to because it's a huge burden otherwise we're imposing on future generations. And I've now got a grandchild. And you know he doesn't want to live in the kind of world. If we don't address it, it's gonna it, we're going to hand over to it. And you managed to bring us to a close on a moment of optimism. So thank you for that too. Please join me in thanking again our honorees for this conversation and for their accomplishments. Thank you very much, Bruce, for moderating this panel with our honorees. And uh, it, the discussion, um, while very somber because of the times we live in, and thank you, thank you all for being here, and we're very pleased. Uh, let me first say, before I close things out, I want to add my own um, love to what my chairman said in the opening part, and that is to Kathy Manat and the Manat, I don't know whether I didn't see Kathy, I saw Michelle. There's Kathy. I came to this town 40 plus years ago, and Chuck Manat picked me out. I didn't pick him out, and I, he was a mentor to me, and I loved him, and uh, I am so glad that you're here tonight and that we named this award in his honor. Let me also give a shout out to our former CEO and President Bill Sweeney, who, um, and, and Susan. Bill Sweeney led this organization for many years and left it in, the, uh, in good shape and the kind of shape that now uh, Tony and his team can now take us to the next level. So let me close things out. Um, first of all, you did an incredible job here tonight of outlining the challenges that we have um, as we move forward uh, in the work of IFAS uh, to support democracy and free and fair elections around the world. 
Uh, my deepest thanks, and, and we can never do this enough, to all of you, to everybody in this room um, who gave us the resources and who talked to their colleagues to, to bring in the resources to contribute to this work. And we know it's difficult in all organizations and there are a lot of choices. But your support comes at a critical time in the global democracy movement and we deeply appreciate it. Over the last decade, just to talk about how stark things are and why this work is important, we've seen democratic backsliding and the waning of democratic freedoms and civil liberties in some very surprising parts of the world, which we heard discussed tonight. IFAS is adapting and responding to these emerging, challenge, emerging challenges and will continue to work with you to advance a citizen's right to have a say in how they are governed. Because of those challenges, this year, 2019, IFAS chose action. This is why we embarked on an ambitious strategic planning process, beginning with a new vision and mission, which we shared publicly uh, with you for the first time tonight. We are galvanized by our new vision and mission, and we are excited by what we have coming uh, in this coming year. And if you follow social media and our website, you will see more about that as we go, as we go along. And to close, let me say how honored I am to serve this organization as, I, as my other colleagues are in the celebration of democracy and the three remarkable individuals we honored tonight. I hope you all enjoyed the, the uh, conversation uh, and the discussion up here. And I would also finally like to applaud the IFAS staff led by Tony Banbury and all of the work that goes into doing not only this kind of an event, but the people that we have on this staff who leave their homes and go around the world to places that, uh, that uh, the average person would not choose to go and spend their time to, to bring democracy and to work for free and fair elections. And some of them are here and some of them are out in the remote parts of the world. And thank you to the staff. Thank you to the people that do this work. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next year at this dinner in 2020. <laughs>